thank you for letting me talk to you. You're welcome. I'm glad you came. Um, your name is Mary. I, how do you say it? Cock. One chicken with a quiet E. There you go. Now, uh, how did you know I was Presley? Well, when uh, I was a nursing supervisor at Baptist, I was a supervisor of one floor. And you're going to get buttons in this, as you hear. That's fine. But you don't shut her up. It's your home. But uh, she, uh, Dr. Nick told me that Elvis was coming in. He wanted him to come to my floor. He sent all of his patients. The group he was in sent all of his patients to me. Mm-hmm. And so he uh, <coughs> told me he was coming in. And we had the suite available at the time. And I said, well, when's he coming? He said, probably in the next day or two. And I said, well, I'll lock the suite then. So I locked up the suite and called admissions and told them not to give it to anybody that uh, it was being saved for someone special. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they... um, They did that, too. And then uh, a couple of days later, so a couple of days, well, the day before Elvis was supposed to come in, he came and he said, Miss Cock, Elvis is coming in in the morning. And I said, "Mm, okay. I said, I'll tell my charge nurse tomorrow that uh, he's coming in, so she'll be looking for him. And he said, well, where are you going to be? And I said, well, I'm not going to be here. I'm off tomorrow. And he said, well, I need you to be here. And I said, I'm off tomorrow. I said, he said, well, will you come in? I said, Dr. Nick, I don't give a two days off a week. And, you know, I was never an Elvis fan before that time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, he was just any other Joe that was coming in the hospital. Why should I give up my day off for somebody I didn't know? Just in the patient. And uh, I was, well, and, you know, I had been given a front row seat tickets to his concert one time. I gave him to somebody else. I said, I'm not an Elvis fan. Mm. But anyway, he said, well, if you won't do it for him, do it for me. So I got up the next morning about 4.30 when he called me. And I got to the hospital about 5.30, and they were already there. And, man, I just walked in the door, and that was all it took. And he was sitting on the side of the bed. Linda Thompson was shaving him. And Joe Esposito and Vernon and Dick Grobe. And one other guy, I think it might have been Al Strada, I'm not sure, um, were sitting there, and I met all of them. And then he said, and you know who this is? I said, yeah, I know who he is. So in just a couple of minutes, they all left. And as they started out the door, um, Joe came back to the door and he said, well, we need to uh, talk about private duty nurses, hush buttons, and, um, and, and I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to Miss Cox first. I'm sorry. It's okay. She didn't stop. He said, I'm going to talk to Miss Cox first. So that afternoon, about 1 or one thirty, he said, what do you want me to do about private duty nurses? And I said, I don't care, honey, anything you want to do. And he said, well, I'll have them if you want me to, but I want you to take care of me. And I said, then you won't need private duty nurses. So I took care of him on my shift. Mm -hmm. And then I had the 3 to 11 nurse take care of him on her shift, the charge nurse. And then I had the charge nurse on 11 to 7 take care of him, which was a great arrangement. Of course, we had security posted outside the door at all times. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a great arrangement and worked out well. But there was only one problem, and that was the night nurse was very, very shy. She was a black lady, about mm, probably 35 or 40 years old. And she, one morning he said, could you possibly change my night nurse? And I said, what's the matter with Miss Thompson? He said, she don't look at me. And I said, is that the only thing wrong with her? He said, she won't look at me. He said, she's nice. She just won't look at me. And he wanted somebody to come in and look at him and would visit with him. Right. And she would come in and do what he asked her to do. But then she was out the door in a hurry. So we had an LPN hush that also worked at night with her. So that afternoon, come on, you want to get up here with Grandmama? Come on. Come on. So that afternoon, I left word with the... 3 to 11 charge nurse. <laughs> it's, it's a precious girl. 
with the 3 to 11 charge girl, charge nurse, that, to ask uh, this other nurse to be his nurse. And I said, if Miss Thompson asks why, we'll just tell her that, that we thought she might want a break from it. So the next morning when I get, get to work, um, she was at the desk, and I said, how did everything go last night? And she said, oh, Miss Cox, thank you so much for, for letting um, whatever her name was um, take care of him. I said, Tabitha, what was wrong? I said, he's a really nice guy, and he liked you. But he said you wouldn't look at him. And she said, oh, no, no. She said, I didn't look at him. She said, He's, I, she said, I just couldn't do it. She said, I just I just couldn't talk to him. She said, my, I was just tongue-tied when I was going there. But she was really that way with most patients. Mm-hmm. She would go in the room. He was no exception. And she would go in the room, and he would, um, I mean, in any patient's room. And she went in to do what she had to do, and she left. Right. And she was a very nice person. She was an excellent nurse. But she was not talkative. And we'd have staff meetings, and you can hardly ever get her to say a word. Mm-hmm. But she was a fine really lady, huh? She was just really shy. Yeah, she was. Sure. And actually, he was too. And then it made him more so, because once he got to know somebody, he would loosen up. He was shy. But, but yeah, he was, you know, he didn't look at someone immediately and snap them up. I guess that's why he said he wanted to wait and talk to me for a while before he decided. But uh, anyway, then, then, so I was with him for, he was there about three weeks. And then when he went home, um, I didn't see him anymore till August. And then when he came back the second time, he, um, he um, wanted me to stay at night. And so I'd go home in the afternoon and stay and cook supper, and then I'd go back in the room outside. The suite was reserved for me, and then the other room across the hall was was for the flowers. We had so many flowers. Really? Oh, tons of them. He, and he did not did not want flowers in his room. Well, you send them out to other patients? Said, yeah, we took them out to other patients. But, um, the, and I stayed in the room across the hall. And then if he wanted anything, he wouldn't put on the light for the night nurse, he'd come in and shake my shoulder and say, let's go, let's go. And most of the time it was, I can't sleep, would you get up and talk to me? And I'd get up and put my robe on and go in the sitting room with him and we'd just visit. Hmm. Did you have problems with some of the nurses like wanting to go in and take care of Elvis? No, well, they never voiced their opinions because they knew that they weren't going to get any place with it anyway. Hmm. So the nurse taking care of him uh, did everything for him. I mean, he could take his own bath, and, and you had, they, had, they had to make his bed, just like I made his bed on the 73 shift, let housekeeping come in to clean, but we had security the whole time, 24-7. Any problems with the security, like people trying to get on the floor? Oh, yeah, we had that all the time. We had x-ray people come up with all their equipment one day at lunchtime, so they came to do the portable x-rays on him, and the, so the guard called me, because I was down at the nurse's station, and and he said, can you come down here just a second? I went down and I said, what's up? And he said, they said they had to do portable x-rays on him. And I said, no, they don't. He doesn't have any x-rays ordered. I said, get your equipment and get off this floor. I'm being sneaky. Mm-hmm. And I had a lady come over from the University of Tennessee one day at noon, and she asked to see me. And I was, happened to be in his room, so I went out and I asked her what she wanted. And she said she worked for a doctor. And she called his name and said he knew that you were the nurse and, and she really needed financial help and she wanted me to let her in so she could talk to him. And I said, young lady, you go back and tell your doctor not to pull another stunt like this. Hmm. I had a doctor come up to me several years, about three years ago out at Marlowe's. And he said he was a doctor. I didn't know him. And he was, I think, from Colorado. And he uh, and his wife came through and and we visited, and I think he bought a book or something, and then they went on in to eat. When they came out, uh, he had he stopped, and he there was nobody in there but me and two or three other people, and he put his elbow down on the table, and he looked at me, and he said, um, Tell me, what happened to Elvis? And I said, He died. He said, Oh, but you can tell me. He said, uh, I'm a neurosurgeon, and you can tell me what happened. And I said, if you're a doctor, then you should know better than to come ask me that. Mm-hmm. And I just turned my back on him. 
Were you a nurse uh, at Graceland too for a while? Uh, yeah, for over a two and a half year period. Uh, when he went home the second time, Dr. Nicopolis said that he wanted to have a nurse at the house mm-hmm. uh, to monitor his blood pressure and his medications. So Elvis said, well, I'm going to take Miss Cock with me. And I said, Elvis, I can't go out there with you. i got a job. And he said, well, can't you ask your husband if you come out for a couple of weeks? And I looked at Dr. Nick and I said, how long is this going to be? He said, probably a couple of weeks. And I said, well, let me go talk to Rob and Katie about it. I won't give you an answer without talking to them. So that night we were eating supper and and uh, I told him about it. Of course, Katie was thrilled. She said, oh, mother, I think that would be great. <laughs> I bet. And Bob said, how long is this going to last? And I said, they said two or two and a half weeks. And he said, well, if it's no longer than that. And um, I told him, I said, I'm not going to let him pay me. And he said, no, I don't want you taking this money. And so the next day I went in. And Dr. Nick was in the room when I went in. And the first thing I said was, can you come? And I said, yeah, I can for two to two and a half weeks. And he said, okay. And uh, he said, bring your Social Security card. And I said, what do I need that for? He said, so you can get paid. And I said, no, I don't want your money. I'll do what I can for you, but I don't want your money. And he said, why the hell won't you take my money? Everybody else will. And I said, I just don't want it. And I never took a salary from him. Hmm. And then I, that ran into six months or better. Wow. And the only reason I left then was because of my mother's illness. Hmm. And, and she was terminally ill, and so I left. And then by then, he was fine. He really didn't need anybody with him. I was just company for him. Did you set up the next nurse that came? No, he didn't want me to nurse. No. Now, there was one that came during the day. She'd get there about 10.30 or 11, and she worked on my floor 3 to 11. She was the charge nurse. I almost had to fire her because she'd come in late every day from Graceland. And I told her, I said, you've got a paying job and a non-paying job, so you pick which one you want. And then finally, at Christmas time, he went to Vegas, and he came back, and he said he wouldn't meet her anymore. Hmm. So she didn't come back anymore. What did you think of Graceland? Oh, I thought it was really nice. I'd been in Graceland years before Elvis Presley ever bought it. Really? Because my parents were friends of the of the people that owned it. Mm-hmm. And um, so I had been in the house. In fact, in the dining room, as well as I remember, Ruth Marie Moore had a dining table that would seat, I think she said, 24 people. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the house was totally differently furnished. And there were additions to the house. And I told Elvis one night that I had um, dreamed about the upstairs bedroom where he was. And he said, what did you dream it was? And I said, I I said, I've been in the house a number of times, but I said, I had never been up in the master bedroom. I said, I thought it was all in white. And he said, it was when I bought the house. But he had changed it all. But it was was a nice house, very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. He would seem to be very giving. Oh, he was too giving. He it was, was too fault. giving for his yeah. own word, for his own good. That was that was a major fault he had. Mm-hmm. He he cared about more about giving than helping other people than he did himself. And I know one night we were talking, and he said, "Don't you need a microwave?" And I said, "What do I want a microwave for?" And I said, well, don't you need it to help with your cooking? You know, he said, you go home from work and you cook supper for your family and then you come out here. I said, I don't need a microwave. We've got a stove. And there was a nurse that lived on the property that worked for Dr. Nick and her husband. And Tish is, if you've gotten Dr. Nick's book, Tish is all through his book Mm -hmm. because she had been out there before I came. And during the period of time that I was there, I don't think I ever saw Tish I might have seen her one time, but she was never around when I was there. But anyway, um, she uh, had told him she needed a microwave because she was working and she had to come home at night and cook. So he said, she needs one. Don't you need one, too? And I said, I don't want a microwave. And then when he told me, the, when the, before, the second time he went in, when he told me he had a car coming for me the next day, I said, I don't need a car. And he said... Well, hell, you're getting one. And I said, I can't drive but one at a time. 
And he said, well, you can do anything with it you want to, but i got a car coming for you tomorrow. And it was a beautiful white Pontiac, all white and other upholstery. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I have to tell you, I was in his room making his bed. It was about 1 or 1.30 in the afternoon. And he called me. He was looking out the windows on to Madison Avenue from the 18th floor. And he said, come here a minute. I don't know. I said, what you want? And he was dangling these car keys. And he looked and he said, there's your car. Go get it. And I said, yeah. And I threw those keys out of his hand. And I took off and went to the nursing office. Met the vice president of nursing and a girl that I worked with. And, and one of the associate directors. And I said, y'all come on and see my car. So we traipsed across Madison Avenue, and the man was standing there, and he was dangling some more keys, and he said, she's all yours, and he gave me all the papers. So I looked up on the floor, and Elvis and Linda were standing there looking out the window, and the first thing I did was run over the curb, and I looked up again, and he had his hand on <laughs> So we went to the parking lot and um, parked the car, and then after work, I went out to get in my car, and all the TV stations were there. We didn't have but three in town then. They were all there. Maury said it, or someone had let them know, and they were all there to do film. And so I went on and picked my mother up. She lived in a high-rise in, in, down, in Midtown. Rode her around the block so she could see my car. And my dad was, he was a retired Army man, but he also liked to work, and he liked to walk, so he wasn't at home. So I drove mother around a little bit. And went on home, and when I got home, the telephone was running. So Bob was out looking at the car, and I went in and answered the phone, and it was Elvis. He said, you get home okay? I said, yeah. You tired, honey? (laughs) (laughs) And uh, he said, uh, I said, yeah, I got home fine. And uh, he said, well, he said, I just want to tell you something. And I said, what? And he said, the next time I give you a car, you be sure that I look to make sure my bed's finished, that my bed is made. And I said, oh, my goodness, I didn't finish making your bed, did I? I said, did somebody else come in and do it for you? And he said, no, I did. He said, I finished making it. Oh, goodness. Um, when was the last time that you saw all this? A few days before he died, uh, he called me one morning about 2 o'clock. I wanted me to come out and sit with him. And he just couldn't go to sleep, and and uh, Ginger was there, and she was milling about, and uh, I just sat on the side of the bed. We probably didn't say a dozen words, and I sat there for about four hours. And finally, he said, he said, I think I'm okay now. You want to go home? And I said, okay. You sure? And he said, yeah, I'm okay. And he said, I think I can go to sleep now. And I got to the door to go out, and he said, Miss Cock. And I, I turned around, and looked at him, and I said, what is it, honey? And he said, the doors of this house will always be open for you. And those were the last words he spoke to me face to face. The morning he died, he called to say, and you know I'm going out of town today. Will you come out before I go and rub my back and have a cup of coffee with me? And I said, yeah. And um, he didn't quite make it. Uh, you were talking earlier about the, uh, the 35th anniversary coming up. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that, what you've got planned? Well, we're going to have it in the Memphis Ballroom. Mm-hmm. And that'll hold, on the 30th anniversary, they asked me to keep it to 900, and I said, no, I can't do that. We had almost 1,100 packed. Oh, my goodness. And uh, they were almost, they were so tight, they were almost eating off each other's plates. But um, we had, um, for for this uh, big anniversary, I've already talked to um, a, a good friend of mine about being there with his band, Mm-hmm. And I don't want to tell you all the details okay. about okay. it, but we have planned a lot of things we've never had before mm-hmm. there. And um, all I can tell you is it is going to be outstanding. Cool. It really will be. The cost, the price, of the tickets now are eighty-five dollars a piece. They probably I asked the, the lady at the catering about. Two years from now, was when I when I made the arrangements for it, and I said, "We're paying 85 now. How much are we going to have to pay in two years?" And she said, "It usually goes up about four percent a year." Mm-hmm. So she said, "It's probably going to be about eight percent, which is really an odd figure. It's mm-hmm. an odd number." 
And so I said, well, we probably go up to $90 a ticket. But it was funny. When I first started the dinners, the tickets were $35 a piece. And Sam Phillips got up at the University of Memphis at George Klein's memorial thing. And he said, when Mary Ann said she was charging $35 a piece for those tickets, I thought she'll never do it. Why, you didn't have to pay that much to go see Elvis thing. And he said, she surprised me. He said, she filled that place up. Really? So we have, we have a good crowd this year. Uh, we don't have quite as many as we did last year. We're hoping to get more this year. But we'll wait and see. And Whatever yeah. we had, we've got a great show planned for this year. And we're going to have an even greater show for 2012. I've already told Priscilla. I said, Priscilla, 2012 will going to knock your eyes out. Because she was at the 30th anniversary. Uh-huh. And um, so she was there to greet the fans and everything. So I told her, I said, this one's going to be even bigger and better. But we're going to have a live band. We're going to have um, a complete show. We're going to have um, very few entertain entertainers, but much entertainment. Mm-hmm. Well, sounds like it's going to be fun. It is. It's going to be great. Are you surprised at the, the popularity of Elvis no. still today? No. Uh, I remember one night uh, after this bad book came out that the three guys had written, uh-huh. and he was so upset by that, and he wondered how the fans were going to be affected. And I said, well, let me tell you this. The people that read it and... Uh, uh, I said, the people that know you are not even going to bother to read it. If they know you and care, you, care about you, they're not going to bother to read it. And the others, I said, I wouldn't worry about their opinion. And uh, he said, well, he said, do you think I'll be remembered? And I said, oh, yeah, you're going to be remembered. And he has never proven me wrong. If there's any one memorable moment, <laughs> that you could ever tell. I can answer that before you ever finish. Every single one. Did Every you? single one. If I had to pick one out of a jillion, mm-hmm. it might be the night he reached over and put his hand on my knee and said, Miss Cock, you're one of the few people I know who's never asked anything of me but friendship. It must have been hard because it seemed like everybody wanted something from him. Mm-hmm. But, uh, Later on, as you got to know him, you did attend a concert. He asked me one night, Miss Cocker, you ever been to any of my shows? I said, Nope. <laughs> he said, You haven't? I said, I wasn't a fan of yours. He said, Well, hell, are you now? And I said, Well, I am now, but I know you now. So then I went to one of his concerts. And it was great. Somebody said, are you going up and get a, a scarf? And I said, no, I'll get him to give me one at the house. <laughs> and I'll tell you the truth, he gave me two. One for me and one for Katie. And I couldn't tell you what, I, what happened to mine or hers either. I don't have a clue. Was it one of the shows he put on oh. or Memphis? Or? Oh, yeah, it was one of the Memphis shows. Did you ever... Make it out to Vegas. Honey. Yeah, he took me the first time I went. What did you think of the Vegas show? Which one? Anyway. Well, the only Vegas show I've ever been to was this was about a month ago when these people from Encino, California, took me to Vegas, and that was a wonderful weekend. Some people named Ryan just took me, and they're from Encino, California. And they took me, and it was a wonderful weekend. And that was the first show I'd been to um, like that. And, and, of course, because that was only the second time I'd ever been to Vegas. And then uh, it was Sean Clush. And mm-hmm. Sean Clush put on a very good show. Mm-hmm. He did a really great job. Do you find a lot of people, they want to hear the, well, they want to hear the dirt? Are you asked that a lot about just bad things? I'll just make it clear from the very beginning that, that I won't tell you anything about Elvis that, that I mm-hmm. didn't know about. And I won't, would tell you nothing about medications, or about mm-hmm. his health, or about his personal life. And I still won't. Yeah, I don't know why people even And I don't know why that. people ever bring it up, because yeah. I'll tell them from the outset, I'm not going to tell you that, so don't ask anything. Mm-hmm. I don't know why people need to but know But see, the you just stuff. did. 
Asking Normally. Me other, no, but asking me if other people ask me that. Yeah. But, yeah, every once in a while somebody will say something, I'll just tell them they're inappropriate. Yeah. Hmm? You know, I think you have a good relationship with Priscilla. Oh, yeah. So what type of a person is she? Because you don't get to hear much. No. Priscilla is a wonderful lady. Mm-hmm. She's very loving, and she's she's involved in a lot of charity work, as is Lisa. They both are. Mm-hmm. And um, the, I guess the last time I saw her was in... May, she was here, and uh, it was around her birthday, and, and uh, I took uh, ice cream and cake out to Grace, and I make a really good Kahlua ice cream. Mm-hmm. I have two of those little Quasin Art freezers, and Jack Soden mm-hmm. just loves it. And Priscilla is not a sweet eater. But she, she looked at me and she said, you know I'm not a sweet eater. And I said, I know you'd rather have an apple or a pear. And uh, she said, but I'm going to eat some of your cake and ice cream. And she did. And she mm-hmm. said, I have to admit it was really good. Mm-hmm. But, I stayed away from family. <laughs> I didn't yeah. ask anything about family. Yeah, but the, she is a very fine lady. She's very giving. She's very loving. She is an extremely nice lady. How mm-hmm. was Vernon? Vernon was a very nice man. They all were. Yeah. They were all very, very nice to me. I didn't know anything from anybody about anything from Gladys' side of the family because, of course, she had been long dead when I met Elvis. But all of Vernon's side of the family were always very nice. In fact, his sister Delta that lived in the mm-hmm. house, when she died, she left all of her personal belongings to me. Wow. She did. I went out there, and I'm going to tell you, I never saw so much stuff in my life. And... Um, so I left much of it out there because she had also said that what I didn't want to leave for the maids. Well, I left them a lot of good stuff. And, and I also got two mink coats. And I turned around and gave one of those to Nash because she didn't have a mink coat. But, um, no, Delta and I were very close. And Grandma and I were close. Because mm. I visited them a lot. I've slept in that bedroom in that bed on the first floor that you guys see when you go through there. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Did Elvis ever bring up and talk to you about his mom? Overnight. Really? Mm-hmm. We, there wasn't a dime that he didn't talk about her. Somehow or other, she entered every conversation we ever had. Wow. Even if it was just a few words, but he always mentioned his mother. I always wondered if it would happen longer, if she lived longer. Well, we'll never know. We'll never know.